Good afternoon everyone. My name is Melody Maharaj. I'm really really happy to be joining you guys from Los Angeles. Uh, I apologize this uh, recording. Um, I had to you know this is a pre-recording uh, because few people are currently working at home uh, that I was afraid um, if I give a live speech you know my internet will really come and kind of become a, a problem. Uh, but I'm hoping to join you guys um, um, live after the speech uh, so you can um, you know shoot me any questions uh, or we can discuss or anything with few minutes we have afterwards so I look forward to talking to you guys um, so my today I want to talk about women conquering space technology uh, before that I want to give you a little bit of my background so you guys understand um, where you know how my background kind of fit into each and every move I had in my in aerospace industry. Um, I'm a Sri Lankan. I'm Sri Lankan born. Uh, I went to um, up to high school in Sri Lanka. Uh, then you know my my parents at the time thought um, you know they it, my parents are very traditional, so they uh, wanted me to become a medical doctor. But I had the engineering mind, um, so I didn't make it to medical school. Uh, so soon after I got married and in 17 years ago uh, I moved to US and then I realized in US I have the opportunity to go back to school and embark in my engineering degree. Um, at the time I my children were uh, three and five they were very young but I did not want to um, take that as an excuse. My ch Our children are never um, excuse to achieving our fullest potential. I, I really didn't want to um, one day talk about my potential and did not want to bring up my children uh, into the conversation. So I decided to go back to school um, um, and I went to UCLA and got my mechanical engineering degree. And few years after, um, I went to Judge Cambridge Judge Business School uh, in UK and got my MBA. Uh, first 10 years, I worked as an engineer um, in US aerospace industry. So my first job was at SpaceX. At that, that was in 2010. So at that time, um, Elon Musk, you know, um, owner of SpaceX, founder of SpaceX, he didn't have a successful launch when I joined the company. So it was up to that point for failures. Uh, and Elon was Musk was not even a very famous, you know, celebrity like uh, now. You know, he is the most celebrated entrepreneur in the, you know tech entrepreneur in the world now. Um, so uh, I had the privilege of joining SpaceX, and I'll tell you uh, a, a little bit of my path. Be uh, before that, I want to tell you what are the things that I did right in school and what are the things I did wrong in school. So let's start with wrong. I like to get the bad energy out. Uh, what are the wrong things I did in school? I did not have time to do summer internships. And I thought I, I, my ego took over uh, m more than my aspiration. Uh, why I say ego? Uh, I, I, my, I, my undergrad, I went to UCLA. So UCLA is a, a very well-known uh, technical university. And I thought if I have an, uh, a degree from UCLA, that's good enough to get me a job. Uh, boy, I was so wrong. Uh, I, when I graduated, it was the height of the recession. So uh, I was struggling to get my first job. So what are the things that I did right? Um, I took communication classes in school. Uh, my undergrad degree did not require me to take speech classes, but I knew I had accent. Uh, my my in English was second language to me. I knew if I'm going to be a successful engineer one day, I need to be able to communicate well to a, a long, vast range of people. It could be technicians, it could be the business division, it could be um, the more experienced engineers and you know the decision makers. So the as an engineer. One thing that I realized that my, I need to be able to communicate to every broad range of people. So I took some speech classes and you know even advanced speech classes. 
uh, then I also took 3D modeling classes. Um, it was, you know, I, I only had to take like one or two classes uh, for my uh, requirement, but I liked it so much. I ended up taking many modeling and analysis classes um, in 3D, you know, 3D modeling. And I did not like, so the other part is I just did not like uh, doing um, coding. Uh, it didn't come naturally to me, maybe because, you know, my high school, up until high school, I was not exposed to coding. Uh, so I was struggling and uh, it didn't stop me. That's why I moved on to learning 3D, which, you know, I'm a more visual learner. Um, so one of the advice I can give you guys is not everybody need to know to code. Like it's okay, it's really helpful when you know coding, but my successful career did not center around, you know, coding. It centered around me being able to visualize things out of nothing. And it the, that help came from learning extensive 3D modeling. So my first job, um, I when I interviewed for SpaceX, uh, I was asked to make a presentation that Elon Musk might be there and my whole team will be there. So there were 11 to 12 people um, at the interview and my first assignment was to give a presentation of any project that I have worked on. Um, I, I looked at, I had many projects that I, you know, obviously when you're an engineering student, you, you, you know, you do a lot of projects. And I, I was, before I was deciding which project I was going to present, and I looked at the psychology behind. Uh, from small days, I realized my biggest learning came from my failures. Uh, and I had so many successful projects and I realized all the candidates for the same job that I applied would also present all the glorified projects. So I realized I'm going to present a, 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 one of the biggest failure projects that I was part of as a senior. And, um, and uh, uh, also at that point I knew Elon did not have a single you know successful launch and I thought it will resonate with him and which it did um, I had very you know pressing questions during my uh, interview but uh, but the con it, 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 it the questions become conversations and and it became very easy conversations because they were facing the same problems with multiple uh, multiple failures and here I come as a you know a perspective employee and I'm talking about my own uh, failures so I uh, that uh, that's how I got my first job and so then I, I was I worked on you know first engines and the first dragon spacecraft to so many first uh, successful uh, designs um, after that and then I moved to Boeing for a few months and then I realized um, you know designing uh, aircrafts it's not my thing and it's a very traditional company hundred something years old at the time um, so as an engineer uh, my contribution was not as much uh, I apologize guys my my dog is always circling around me so i really apologize um and then i moved to nasa afterwards and uh, i worked on nasa mass rover perseverance and my team designed the electrical and telecommunication cable and um so most of my so i worked at nasa for uh, up until 2018 one up until we are done um with our design uh, my, when I look back my career, um, especially as a woman engineer, I will touch upon a um, few pointers for um, specific, specifically women in space. Um, but when you look at the space technology, so I'm talking to both uh, the young girls and the boys, both uh, who are aspiring to be in aerospace industry. So space, so uh, space is most of the time you design something first. We call it prototype. And we we test, we build, we design, we build, we test, and then we launch. 
and we launched the prototype. So uh, when you are designing something in space, it's always the first. Uh, you will run into problems that you cannot open a test book and find the solutions. So you uh, will be rewarded for being creative, but at the same time, creative doesn't mean that you have got all the problems solved. Uh, usually when you run into problems, uh, you first have to define the problem before you find the answers. So my advice is in aerospace industry, um, it's not the most difficult part is not finding the answer. It's always defining what the problem is. Uh, something I learned uh, at uh, working with Elon Musk very closely at the time, uh, he was working you know with us and brainstorming um he he's always the spokesperson for spacex spokesperson for um tesla and how he understood the problems is very inspiring uh you know we run into most of the time big problems when we are you know achieving big heights in space you run into huge problems so how do you solve them? How do you find solution for them? Uh, it's just how you break this problem into digestible portions. That's how Elon understood problems and even contributed, well, most of the time he contributed his ideas, but he first digested uh, uh, the problem by dissecting into small portions. So moving from spacex to my you know boeing and nasa um, i became very efficient as an engineer only because i was not afraid of running into problems i was very much busy defining what the problem is so that it was very easy for my my teammates and other teams to even find solution um, so that's something very unique in uh, space, um, uh, you know, aerospace industry. And also failure. When you're always doing something first, you will run into a lot of failures. So you should be very comfortable failing and learning from it. Not that doing the same, not running into the same failure, but you're learning from your failures. You're not afraid to uh, embark in into a new space uh, you know the most i've learned that the most um, opportunity is where the area is not explored right uh, so if you want to explore the opportunities and grab those opportunities you need to uh, be able to be comfortable navigating the ambiguity uh, that is something uh, very unique in uh, aerospace industry and also my 3d visualization I was dragged into every single new project at SpaceX uh, only because I knew uh, how to visualize three dimension, um, anything new, even the Dragon. I was in the Dragon team. I was in uh, the engine team, rocket engine team, and you know anything new, even. Um, the vertical landing takeoff and landing system which is called grasshopper uh, i was dragged into all of those projects only because i knew how to visualize things so my classes that i took in undergrad really helped me uh, to be part of these innovative uh, teams now i want to talk um, more about specifically women in space so um, space, we are designing for both men and women, but still the space industry is very much a very male dominant industry. Uh, you, wherever you go in aerospace industry, you will find yourself maybe the only woman in, in meetings or wherever you will be one of the two. Uh, so you need to be very comfortable uh, being the minority in the room. Uh, and the other part I want to talk about is, this might be a little controversial, but this is my experience. Uh, at the beginning, at SpaceX, something I learned very early on, 
that I, I, I need to stop seeing me as different. We talk about how different women are, that women perspective is important, yes. Um, but the more you think you're different, you're projecting that to others who are working with you and they are going to see you different. Uh, but only the only way you're going to stop them seeing you different and they are, you are one of them is by you not seeing you're different. Uh, what do I mean by different? Um, when things happen, you know, there are a lot of things happen when you're working day to day, but every time you're trying to uh, rationalize situations by oh this happened because I'm a woman this happened because I'm brown uh, this happened because I'm a I'm, I'm a mother uh, or, or could be anything and you're trying to give an answer to a situation from your you know the the, the aspect of you know you uh, is is not going to help you so you as a woman, you are in aerospace industry or you know in STEM, wherever the project, whatever the project, you are there because you are intelligent to be there. You are there because you are smart to be there. You are there because you are as good as everyone else. So stop look, seeing yourself differently. Uh, your contribution, we think different you know our emotions are different our contribution is different the output can be different but you are equally intelligent smart and deserving to be where everyone else is um, and the other part i want to tell is develop a thick skin uh, it is often said in especially in aerospace industry because we are designing things new they are for the future and it's not been explored when you are presenting your ideas your work uh, there will be hundreds of questions coming at you you should be able to take it as professional um, you know questions um, uh, professional and not personal uh, the moment you take professional uh, queries as personal uh, it 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 um, it's not going to help you. Uh, so develop a thick skin. Everything what happens at work is very professional. The questions are being asked, very professional. How you need to explain things, not because you're a woman. Maybe so, until it is red flag. Uh, aerospace industry, you will be asked a lot of questions because it's new. People don't understand the amazing work you have done. So you need to explain that. Don't take it personal develop a thick skin very early on um, and it's okay to be first uh, so let me tell you why it's okay to be first uh, first human flying uh, human flight was launched in 1961 then we uh, put the first woman in space in 1963 she is valentina terescuba uh, she she was she did not have this PhD and vast experience and you know so forth. She was a parachute jumper. She has jumped 126 times in on uh, from a parachute uh, with a parachute, and she was just 26. I mean, 26 years old. So um, don't have this linear path. Uh, in you for you to achieve conquer certain things and you think there's a certain way you need to achieve things uh, first you was um, a woman in space um, was uh, Sally Ride uh, that was in 1983 then then Canadian um, a woman uh, in space the first one 1992 um, um, she was in the uh, space sh sh shuttle and her name was uh, Roberta Vandra and in uh, 2024 we are going to put the first woman in moon it, it could be one of you guys you know listening to you know uh, this program this today it could be one of you guys so so why did I say all this first first it's because be comfortable being the first uh, in aerospace industry um, especially when you're a woman it, you you will be the first of something 
and uh, wear that in your sleeve uh, you are in a, you are going to be in a very innovative uh, disruptive uh, industry uh, being first is something uh, very common so be very comfortable with that um, and uh, the last one i want to talk about is for everyone um, i i realized in 2015 i was invited for a um, um, a science project as a judge and when i went there i expected a lot of uh, robotic projects instead um, this was in east los angeles very um, poor neighborhood um, and l very less resources and what i saw instead of robot robotic projects were these science projects how to remove graffiti from household products how to make a scrub from sugar and honey and so forth and then i looked around all those projects were projects that these seventh eighth ninth tenth graders um, design as science projects that were solving community problems they had these problems and they were looking at problems um, solutions so 2015 i opened my nonprofit purely because i realized given the opportunity these students can find solutions to bigger better things i started bringing these communities into nasa uh, giving opportunities for teachers and resources uh, to dream and you know creative big um, so uh, space is a really great industry you're designing for the future but space technology, space industry, it's not for everyone. Not everybody is aspiring to do it. And one of the reasons I, I went back to school and got my MBA, because I realized there are more pressing problems in this world. Uh, we spent two, three billion dollars designing Mars rover and, you know, uh, you know, venturing that to space, but I realized there are problems in this world that we can find solution so un united nations has identified you know 17 or 18 pressing problems world problems like the poverty water human rights um and um aids and africa uh, you name it they there are problems in this world that we can solve so Whoever is not aspiring to be in aerospace technology, go, go, you know, find solutions in your neighborhood, in your community, talk to people around, see, try to find problems around you. Uh, you, you don't have to always aspire to be, uh, you know, Elon Musk. Uh, you know, have, own a company like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Amazon, Uber. Yeah, you know, you don't always have to aspire to have this massive, um, you know, owning of finding a company. But you, in your own little world, you can find problems and solutions. So go uh, find uh, those and work on them. And you are as hero as anybody else would be. We're uh, very lucky to have uh, Melanie in real time as well as the presentation she just delivered. And she's actually been, uh, as you can imagine from her uh, accomplished career, she's been so productive. She's been answering the questions in the chat in real time <laughs> as we go along. And uh, so if you have more questions, you can put them in the chat. And I, I would ask, um, you know, there was one question and you answered regarding your hardest moment. Melanie, and you said, learn not to be afraid of the ambiguity. You know, I think I know what you mean because I'm a, an adult and I've had a long career. So I think I know what you mean, but I, I, I'd ask that maybe if you unpack what that means a little bit, that could be helpful for the audience. Okay, so, um, so just like I was saying, um, uh, hi guys, everybody. Um, I'm so glad to uh, join you guys. So to answer the question, so aerospace industry, um, we, we design things new. So when you're designing things new, you cannot open a book and say, oh, I'm going to look at this book and design something. So it's always new. So when you're doing something new, you're, you're, it's like you're going in like in forest. 
like it's it's a forest that is no road paved for you. You had to find your way. So every corner uh, is unknown to you. What you will, the new problems coming to you. You need to first solve those problems in order to get to the next phase. Sometimes you work on something for three four months, and then you realize you went on in a rabbit hole, like like a path that it it's a dead end. So you need to come back. So it's a lot of um, back and forth. Um, unknown area that you're surfacing during the day, uh, just be be um, comfortable knowing, like see the big picture. Big picture is you're going to design this really great spacecraft, uh, which is going to go and find, you know, life or signs of life in, in, in another planet. So look, think about that bigger, greater project and, and not be afraid of your day-to-day -day obstacles. So I think it's a good lesson even to in a, in a live in a regular life, um, not to be afraid. Okay, thanks. Uh, a technical question here. What new technology could be developed to help, to help advance us into a deeper knowledge of space or of space travel? Um, so we, we always like, these are our nerd, nerdy conversations we have <laughs> uh, during our lunch. Uh, how can we just really um, have a leap of in our technology? So I think achieving um, speed of light. Uh, I, I, I personally don't know whether it's possible within the next couple of you know decades, but uh, I think the breakthrough would be achieving that speed of light. And, and, and also, there is, a, there is a section in NASA um, JPL itself where they, only the doctors, extremely experienced, knowledgeable doctors, um, medical doctors are working. So they are doing the reverse. They are trying to see in space, how can they not make us age? If we put people in, in a space mission, and, and see whether we, if we don't get age, I think age is, uh, is a barrier for us, you know, a finite age. So if we can extend that in, I think in space for us, uh, that would be another breakthrough kind of. So these are all these um, uh, coffee chats we have. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's, it's a speed and then how we kind of extend our life uh, could be that. I bet you a lot of people would pay a lot of money to listen to what NASA engineers discuss on their coffee breaks. I bet you it's the most interesting thing you can imagine. It's boring. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, you know, some, something that you, you touched upon, and, and I think we have time for one, one more. It says, uh, the question is, I'm a, I'm a young girl also aspiring to go into aerospace engineering, but concerned because of the gender split between men and women in engineering. Do you have any personal advice for young girls facing the same issue? So I know you touched on it, but clearly it's uh, resonated. So maybe you could expand yeah. on that a little bit. So um, focus on the your passion um, aspect, right? So uh, I get a lot of emails, a lot of LinkedIn messages asking. Sometimes people just flat out sending me their resume, asking me whether I can recommend them to NASA understanding the process and that what it, it takes, even for me working from SpaceX, it took me five years to get to NASA and the Mars Rover program. So build your um, knowledge. Um, sorry if, if there's a noise, there's construction going on in the house. Um, so build your knowledge. How always I say, whether you are in aerospace industry or any other industry, uh, have yourself ready right, uh, for the future opportunities. Uh, so aerospace industry, they are looking for very unique people, unique projects. So this particular project or the competition that these children are going to be involved, I'm very excited because this is a good talking point and experience for them. So look for projects like this, where you can work in, in you know, internationally, you work, so your international the exposure is very important. And so build your knowledge for the future opportunity. And when you know that you have this unique set of experience and knowledge, then I think you're ready. 
Um, but just being a woman is not good enough. You have to know your stuff equally as everyone else um, to be in any industry. So you, you'll do well. Okay. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. And this was a, an incredibly rare and valuable opportunity to get practical insights and uh, personal advice from um, uh, somebody so accomplished. So thank you, Melanie, for taking the okay. time. Okay, I'm so honored. Thank presentation you. Presentation and for the Q&A. That was fantastic.